Skillshare is an online learning community that offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, web design, freelancing, and more. We're already mostly just sitting at home and watching online classes, so why not learn something tangible and develop your creative side? There's so many lessons on painting, productivity, web development, and a whole slew of other topics that you can't really go wrong with Skillshare. This series on productivity, for example, by fellow future attending physician Ali Abdal, is quite good when you're stuck in a productivity rut. And best of all, Skillshare is quite reasonably priced for us debt-ridden college students. It's less than $10 a month for an annual subscription. And if that sounds good, there's an additional kicker. Because Skillshare is sponsoring the video, the first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. So click the link in that description and make this year a productive one. Greetings students and welcome to another lesson on Calculus of Variations. In this video, I'm going to solve an isoparametric problem using the techniques of variational calculus. Suppose I have two points A and B on the xy plane. The point A is given by XAYA, while the point B is given by XBYB. Suppose also that I had a wire of length L, whose length is fixed, but that length is greater than the distance between A and B, which I'll call DAB. And suppose I use this wire to connect these two points to form a curve F of X between A and B. Our goal with this uh, video is to find the shape of the wire, in other words, find the function f of x that maximizes the area under the curve I've constructed from the wire. The reason I'm keeping the length of the wire greater than the distance is that if it were equal to the distance, we would just have a straight line and that's kind of useless. There's only one possible straight line if we construct our problem like that, but we want to be able to choose from multiple curves. Anyway, let's construct our problem. Remember from basic calculus that the area alpha under the curve y equals f of x is given by the integral from y from xa to xb, which are the endpoints of this curve. I'm going to call this integral i. In addition to this, we have a constraint on this function y. The length of the curve y connecting a and b must equal l. Now how do we write that in integral form? Well, we write this as l equals the integral of ds, where ds is the length element of the curve y. In Cartesian coordinates, you can show that ds is just the square root of 1 plus dy by dx squared, or y prime squared. I'm going to write dy by dx as y prime to make the notation simpler. So the length of the curve given by this integral is constrained to be l. That's my constraint. And I'm going to call this constraint integral j. In the end, I've got a calculus of variations problem, which is to maximize the integral of y, which I'm going to label as capital F, while adhering to the constraint that the length of the curve be L. And I'm going to label the expression inside the constraint integral as capital G. How do I solve this constraint variation problem? Well, I set up a composite functional K, which is just I plus lambda J, where lambda is a Lagrange multiplier. If I substitute the integrals, this is what I get. We can take the lambda inside the second integral and combine both of these integrals since the limits are the same, and they're both with respect to X. Now that we've got our combined functional, what I'll do is apply the Euler-Lagrange equation to the expression that's being integrated, which is really just f plus lambda g. The Euler-Lagrange equation, by the way, would then be given by the partial with respect to y of f plus lambda g minus the derivative with respect to x of the partial with respect to y prime of f plus lambda g, and that all equals zero. Let's now plug in these partial derivatives into our Euler-Lagrange equation. The partial with respect to y is just 1, there's only a single y in the expression being integrated. And to get the partial with respect to y prime, you take the power of 1 half down and then subtract the power by 1. So you get the same square root term, but now it's in the denominator because the power is negative 1 half. However, you still need to apply the chain rule to take the partial with respect to y prime of the term inside the square root. And when you do that, you get 2y prime in the numerator. You can then cancel the 2's and simplify to get the following differential equation for y. The next step is to get rid of this d by dx by integrating both sides directly with respect to x. When we do that, this 1 becomes an x plus an integration constant that I'll call c1. Then what we can do is move all this lambda y prime stuff to the right and then we'll square both sides. And after squaring both sides, here's what we'll end up with. The next step is to cross multiply and move this denominator to the other side to get the following equation. 
And after that, we'll move this y prime squared term to the right and take the y prime squared term common. The goal here is to isolate the y prime and get a differential equation that's just dy by dx equals something. And finally, we'll isolate the y prime from all this to end up with the simple first order differential equation where I've now changed the y prime back to the dy by dx. Now what we'll do is we'll separate the variables, we'll take the dx to the other side and then integrate both sides to get y as a function of x. The integral with respect to x is a bit involved and requires us to use multiple substitutions. You could of course just use an integration table, but I'm going to be a chad and do the integration by hand. We'll start by letting u equal x plus c1. In that case dx is just du if we differentiate u with respect to x. And then if we make the u substitution, the x plus c1 just gets replaced by u and our integral ends up looking considerably cleaner. From this integral we now have to do another substitution, which could be a trig substitution because of the square root term, like you could let u now equal lambda times sine theta or cosine theta since it's the square root of something minus our variable squared. However, instead of needlessly complicating things, we'll let another variable v equal lambda squared minus u squared, in that case, dv is just negative 2u du, which would make du equal negative dv over 2u. When we make the second substitution to put everything in terms of v, here's what we'll get. Now, the u's cancel, and when we take the negative 1 half outside, this is what we get. When we integrate this, we get negative 1 half times 2 square root of v plus c2 prime, where c2 prime is the other integration constant. This choice of prime is quite deliberate, by the way, as you'll see later. Next, we'll plug in the v in terms of u, and then we'll plug in the u in terms of x to end up with y as a function of x. We'll now move the c2 prime to the left and create another constant c2 that's the negative of c2 prime. And that's why I used the c2 prime initially, so I could get a c2 at the end. And when we do that, this is what our equation becomes. And finally, we can square both sides and move the x plus c1 term to the left to get x plus c1 squared plus y plus c2 squared equals lambda squared. And this is actually the equation of the circle with radius lambda centered at negative c1 comma negative c2, and I'm going to call this equation star. Now, the c1, c2, and lambda are unknown constants, so how do we find them? Well, we use the boundary conditions given by the points a and b. At x equals xa, y is ya, and at x equals xb, y is yb. However, we need a third equation to solve for all three constants. And what equation might that be? That's right, it's the constraint equation for the length of the arc connecting a and b. When we solve these three equations, we'll find values for our three unknown constants. And let me actually give you an example of this with some actual numbers. Suppose a and b are two points on the x-axis with xa at square root of negative 3 and xb at square root of 3. Suppose also that the length of the arc connecting a and b is 4 pi over 3. Let's start by substituting these points into the equation of the circle that we have up here, starting with point a. I'll call this equation 1. We then plug in point b into equation star to get the following, and I'll call this equation 2. Since lambda squared and lambda squared are equal, we can equate the left-hand sides of 1 and 2 to get the following. Now the c2 squares are, are going to cancel, and we're left with this equation just in terms of c1. The only possible solution to this equation is c1 equals 0, so we've solved for one of our constants effectively. If we then plug in this c1 equals 0 into, say, equation 2, we'll get the following equation in terms of the remaining two unknown constants, c2 and lambda, and I'll call this equation 3. The last equation we have is the constraint equation, which is given by the following. We can substitute negative and positive square root of 3 for the limits of this integral, but the main problem is that we don't know what y prime is in terms of x. But that issue can be solved by going up and finding the expression for the derivative y prime that we got when we were originally solving the differential equation, which is right up here. And since my c1 is 0, I can plug in a cleaner expression down below to get the following for my constraint integral. I'll combine the 1 with the fraction in the square root to then get this expression. And now if we use the trig substitution and let x equal lambda sine theta, then dx will just be lambda times cosine theta d theta. 
If we then plug this into our integral and use the fact that sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, then our integral will become the following in terms of theta. We can now integrate this to get lambda theta, and if we plug x back in, we'll get an arc sine or inverse sine in our answer. Let's apply the limits and substitute the length of 4 pi by 3 into our equation to get the following. Now it's kind of hard to analytically solve this kind of equation uh, involving arc sine for lambda, but if you use the high school fact that the sine of 60 degrees or pi by 3 is square root of 3 over 2, then you'll believe me when I say that the solution to this equation is lambda equals 2. If I go back to equation 3 then, I'll find that my c2 is the square root of 1, so either positive 1 or negative 1. But which one is it? Well, if I draw my xy plane and I draw these two points a and b, then if I have a circle of radius 2 and the arc I use to connect a and b is of length 4 pi over 3, I have two possibilities. One possibility is that the center is above the x-axis at 0, 1, which would mean that c2 is negative 1, since c2 is negative of the y-coordinate of the center. The other possibility is that the center is below the x-axis, in which case c2 would be 1. Now, if my circle has a radius 2, then its semicircle would have a length of 2 pi, because 2 pi r is the full circumference, therefore pi r is the uh, half circumference or the length of the semicircle. However, the length I'm restricted to is 4 pi over 3, which is actually less than 2 pi. As a result, the circular arc connecting a and b has to be smaller than a semicircle, which means that the center of our circle must actually be below the x-axis at 0, comma, negative 1. And as a result, c2 would then be equal to 1. So in the end, the equation of the curve of fixed length connecting the points a and b, which maximizes the area underneath the curve, is a segment on a circle given by the following equation, at least for this particular example. This is the solution to the isoparametric problem, the calculus of variations problem involving a curve of fixed perimeter or a fixed length. One question you might ask is that since the functional we sought to optimize did not depend on x, since k did not depend on x, could I have used the Beltrami identity? The answer is that yes, I could have done that, since there's no explicit dependence on the independent variable. However, using the Euler-Lagrange equation in this case is actually simpler, which is why I chose that approach instead of the Beltrami approach. So, in conclusion, the circle is the curve which maximizes area for a given perimeter. It's the solution to this standard isoparametric problem, and we prove that this is indeed the case using calculus of variations. Of course, my standard caveat is that in order to truly show this is a maximum, we would need to use the second variation, but I'll cover that in the next video. Anyway, that should do it for the lesson. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.